Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some you've heard of, some you've never heard of. Um, like founder of P90X, Tony Horton, I add on. And um, I, you know, I'll introduce Dr. Miller in a second, but Dr. Miller, you know, I love to hear the challenging low point stories. And Tony Horton talked about, yeah, he sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X, but what was interesting to me was when he drove cross country to try and make it, he um, made money as a street mime for food and rent money. So he would put his head on the street, he would do street miming, and the money he collected would go towards food and rent money. Um, and there's other people people have never heard of, which are just inspiring stories, which is um, I had Chris Atageka, who's a founder of two nonprofits, two for-profits. He grew up in Uganda. You may be able to relate to some of these stories, Dr. Moore. He grew up in Uganda at seven years old. He became an orphan because both of his parents died of AIDS. So being the oldest of five children, he became head of the household and was the caretaker. In an early age, his brother died while walking him to the hospital. He wore his first pair of shoes at age 17. Um, The first time he was on a flight was age 22 from the U.S. uh, from Uganda. He speaks nine languages, ended up coming to the U.S. for college, got his Ph.D. while running his companies. Just a, a, and the, the stories get even you know, crazier in a good way, like the, the stuff he's had to overcome. Um, and so before I introduce today's guest, Dr. Miller, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is we help businesses connect to their dream 100 referral partners, clients, dream guests, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. Um, but for me, podcasting is much more personal. I was sharing this with Dr. Miller before we started is, um, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany and they were the only people of their family to actually survive. And his words and legacy live on because of the interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him. So you can go to inspiredinsider.com and go to the about page. That interview is there in its entirety, um, which is, it has some graphic details. So you know, beware if you uh, are listening to it. And, but I do personally credit podcasting is the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. So if you have a question about podcasting, you want to start one, go to rise25.com, go to support at rise25media.com to email us. And, um, you know, I am really excited. The reason I think I started the podcast over 10 years ago was to have this conversation right now with Dr. Erica Miller, and you'll, you'll hear why in a second. I do want to give a shout out to Jerry Nylans, who runs tradepressservices.com, who introduced me to today's amazing guest. And, um, you know, I'm super excited. So let me give you a, a brief intro into Dr. Erica Miller, who has been, I, I guess she sums it up. By the way, she guests, is a guest speaker all over the world. So if you do need an inspirational, motivational who's done it in many different realms of life and business. She is the one. But her path um, can be described, I think, as grit and gusto gusto, all wrapped into one. Just to give you a brief overview, we'll dig into some of the stories. She survived the Holocaust. She was in the Israeli Air, Air Force. She opened a chain of mental health clinics with over 40 clinicians. She ran a nonprofit, guest speaker all over the world, she also, in addition, oversees families real estate in Austin, Texas. She's written three books, Dr. Erica Miller's story from trauma to triumph. Don't tell me I can't do it. Living audaciously in the here and now and the international bestseller, chronologically gifted, aging with gusto. You can go to drericamiller.com to find out more. Thank you for honoring and blessing us with your presence. First question, Dr. Miller. Yeah. Take me back for a second. Take me back to um, you were, and I don't know what you remember from the time, but um, age seven. And, you know, I was reading on your site that, um, you know, you were herded into cattle cars. Right. Uh 
uh, mayhem. Uh, suddenly, we were heard it, uh, could not understand as a little kid, a curious little kid, I was seven years old, people are pushing and screaming, Yankel, Moishel, people were losing each other. And I kept on asking, what's happening? What's happening? Like now with our epidemics, we need to explain to kids, give them some words. Nobody told me nothing. My mother mm -hmm. kept on saying, don't say anything, don't talk. I did not have a voice. So a mayhem. And so uh, I have memories uh, blink here and there. Uh, because four years is a long time and trauma does that you luckily uh, you forget a lot of the things so I have visions of what I witnessed and experienced for four years in a barbed wired camp uh, it was not self-imposed it was imposed on me just like now I self-imposed to be in a quarantine uh, I was there so four years is an eternity when you think about from seven to eleven and I have very sketchy, kind of like, almost like visions of things. No faces, four years. There were other kids. So yeah, uh, to me, it's absolutely amazing that I survived, not just I survived, that I'm here talking to you, which called in Yiddish, beshert, that means destiny. Like you and me, I mean, I mean, hey, you know, but we just happen to kind of stumble on each other and I don't understand what destiny is all about. So, uh, yeah, I'm still here. And a girl is not supposed to tell her age, but I'm 86. And what can I not do what I could do at 40? Mm -hmm. And my daughter, who is, oh my gosh, 59, can you imagine that? She cannot keep up with me, okay? So I don't mean to brag, I just share and I make you smile. So what else do you want to know? Four years. Um, I mean, this may be a weird question, but what did you eat while you were there? Do you remember any of the details um, at that time? I remember little details and I remember what I was told. Um, um, we had uh, peasants came from, it was in Ukraine, and peasants came to the barbed wires. And... I don't know what we pay them for, but we we could uh, a, we were able to get some eggs, potatoes, peel of potatoes. It was very little to eat, and I remember flashes of my mother giving us food, and she would not eat, and mm -hmm. we insisted that she shared some food uh, because people over the four years they died from typhoid and starvation. Um, they didn't get to us fast enough to the ovens. The Russians liberated us four years later. Mm -hmm. So food was scared and I'm uh, scarce. And I must tell you something really interesting. I have flashes of things that I think I know, oh my gosh, like the wow factor with Freud. Um, I eat very slowly. I chew, I chew slow. And I did not know it's good for you, but it's kind of annoying when you're in the restaurant, whatever. <laughs> and you know, but people are, are finished. And I, so in the early years when I was married, we were never very humble as far economically. And I could not finish the food. And I was too embarrassed to say, pack it up, I'll take it home. Because one meal, when I'm in a restaurant, then I take it home, I have two more meals. So it occurred to me that food was so scarce that you have it in your mouth, you chew, you, 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 know, you want to hold on to it a long time. That is my explanation. Maybe I'm in La La Land. I don't know, but it makes sense to me because food, uh, we are speaking, was really scarce. And I must tell you another quick story. Mm -hmm. um, the brutality of people and the kindness of people. There was a guard, a German big bed wolf guard at the gate. And I was a very curious little kid. And my mother said, make sure you do not go to the guard to check out, to go there. Because uh, yeah, lots of stories how I was, you know, I, I did not listen. I was a bad kid. I just wanted to understand the, the universe. So guess what? I did not listen to mama. So I crawled very quickly and, and he had this big tall, you know, remember I was seven and a half or something like that. So he turned around, grabbed me by my, you know, grabbed me at something. I don't know what I wore. And I thought to myself, uh-uh, I didn't listen to mama. He's going to kill me now. So he said, she looked at me with this very mean face. 
What are you doing here? This is not a place for a little girl. What's your name? And I said, Erica. And he looked at me and so helped me. I don't lie. You don't need to believe me. In a heartbeat, his face softened up and it looked like his eyes were not the, the monster any longer. And he said, I have at home a little girl. Her name is Erica too. Wow. And he sang me this song, which was like almost branded, like a cow. They branded so you know who you belong. That song, Auf der Heide blimmt ein kleines Blümmelein und es heißt Erika on the meadow. It's a very famous German little song in the name. So, and then, so he pushed me down, go back, go back to your mother or something like that. So uh, I just uh, picked myself up and then in a heartbeat, I looked, I, I scared, he threw me a candy bar. Okay, mm -hmm. now. I could not possibly bring a candy bar home and share with mama and my sister, my father, because they would know that I was a bad girl. So and I, and even then I was not the same, but I remember this moment, I felt guilty, but I gobbled up the, the chocolate so that my, my mother wouldn't find out I went there. And then it started at peekaboo in with this guard. So I got some chocolate. So my point being is the brutality of people and the kindness of people. And we experience, all of us, we have to be mindful. There are many layers to all of us. Cut! <laughs> <laughs> Did you witness any brutality there? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, yeah. On the way... Uh, on the way on the train that took us to nowhere, we did not be ever getting. Every time, uh, first of all, uh, we were there, I mean, masses, and the cattle cars started, and they opened the cattle cars, and then they started pushing. And um, I think they were Romanian, because Romanian and German, with bayonet, in Romania it's a bayonet. They were hitting people, and one of them was my father. And one of the things he was on the on the ground, it was raining. He looked like a stuffed puppy because we couldn't take with us anything, I was told. So he had three suits on, who knows what. So they were lucky because they were beating him. And I wanted to go and help Papa. So yeah, there was brutality, baby screaming, just like a chinless list. I mean, I don't need to describe the, the right. mayhem. But again, I wanted to go and help Papa. And my mother just kept me back so I would not be shot. So yeah, so that, that was... That, you know, and more, there's a lot of stories in my first book, From Trauma to Triumph, and I don't mean to just sell my books and that, but it's like... Uh, sell away. People should always check it out. Yeah. You know what? Again, we're speaking about, uh, it's a story, uh, the Holocaust, we commemorate, I think, yesterday or today. Uh, there are many Holocausts, that there are the epidemics, the disasters they're going through one right now. But yeah, so I have flashes of that brutality, the unknown. The biggest thing is like uncharted territory, which we have now with the virus. It's like uh, uh, the train stopped every time, every station, they opened the gates of the train and they pushed in more people. And then they came in and hit people. So we were in the, in the back, in the back, in, in the back of the, of, the, of the cattle car. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm glad I'm here so they will not get to us to beat me before they keep on going, you know? And a kid uh, did not know what goes on. So to entertain myself, I remember singing to myself uh, with the, with the, with, when the train goes, ta 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 Filthy Jews, schmutzige Juden, schmutzige Juden. I used to hear the word dirty Jew. So I made a song to myself. And while the train was rolling, I used to sing dirty Jew, dirty Jew. So when, I, when we got somewhere, and I asked mama, we are not dirty, you know, whatever. Don't talk, sha, sha, sha. So I did not have a voice. So when I don't stop right now. So when my son says, mother, do you always have to say what you feel, whatever. It is, I chew very slowly, so I have food in my mouth, and I, my voice, I'm relevant. I'm speaking out there. I'm positive. I'm inspiring. I'm relevant. Why else am I here? Mm -hmm. I have so many chances, so many of us, never mind the camp. You know, you go on the freeway. So for me to be here and have a conversation with you and feel so alive that I'm going to live till 123. Do you hear me? Tell me why 123, ask me. Why 123? Okay. 
because a woman in France, she lived in Bonnet something or other, she lived till 122 in 64 days. You hear me? If she can lift till 122 in 64 days, I can lift till 123 and I can be in the book of Guinness or whatever. Life choices, I go to the gym every day for 40 years, uh, weights, I'm fit like a fiddle, I am pescatarian, I have a wonderful attitude, positive, and I'm not in La La Land. My cup is half full and not empty, so there is, and I am healthy, I have, like, the only thing I do take medicine is Synthroid, I have, you know, whatever goiter, whatever that is, but I, if a drug doesn't hit me, I have a chance to be living that 123 because they, whoever they are, they say we pick our time of death. And my friends, well, they know already, and please, uh, you know, but I know I'm weird and I love being weird. I'm different. Don't tell me I cannot do it because I'm Jewish. I have to die because I'm a girl. I cannot climb the trees with the boys. I cannot be married, have kids and have a profession. Are you kidding me? So being in the moment, and it's very relevant. I don't mean to preach to your audience. I just share, I don't brag. I know it's weird, but I have a casket at my home, at the, at, at the at bottom of my bed, a beautiful piece of furniture. Uh, and you know what, and I had a, 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 an artist paint me laying there uh, in a white dress, which I have already, as an angel. So again, to me, to preach to the youngins, I'm going to have a party, a rehearsal. Uh, because a rehearsal. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have a rehearsal uh, because meaning to life is death. And yeah, 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 the big stress. Everything is a big deal. Uh, again, uh, we all are going to die. So that's meaning to life is death. So yeah, you die and then they buy a casket. You never see this beautiful piece of furniture and you never hear what people tell you unless you do, I don't know, but the next world, I don't know about that. So yeah, I'm going to have a party and I'm going to have to, to take away, mainly to make a point. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher. Be in the moment. The past is gone, learn from it, have visions for the future. Without visions, you don't go nowhere. But be in the moment. And when you mentioned my, I have many mantras, but the one is with guts, grit, and gusto, or gusto. I don't know which one is right. Uh, guts means courage. It takes courage to survive. We will be okay because uh, we humans are the most resilient species in the universe. Look at us Jews. Are you kidding me? Uh, grit postpone gratification you have a phd you have a doctorate you know you have to postpone the gratification to get some huh? and then gusto is live with passion and purpose because again i don't know why i'm here just because i'm jewish doesn't mean that i have a special relationship there is a god i know nothing i know there is more than meets the eye and i'm not einstein that's what he thought but again being alive and relevant and you live long and well healthily a part of the community, there's more the Moti, Kunalam, all the good stuff that I've researched, that I live by. When I go to, I went up on Mount Everest just last year, are you kidding me? With the youngins from National Geographic, 17,000 feet? Yes, don't tell me I cannot do it, huh? When I jumped out of a plane with my granddaughter in New Zealand six months later in Auckland, hey, she said, I'm going to go and, and jump. I said, if you can do it, I can do it. So she says, Bobby, you know, I'm scared. I said, you know what? <laughs> if the parachute doesn't open, what a wonderful way to exit the world. So my point being is just live in the moment. And this shall also pass. Lots of negativity around us. Whether you're in Chicago, are you in Chicago? Yeah. Okay. I'm in Hidden Hills, huh? It's a sunny day today. It's about 80 degrees or something. How's the weather where you are? <laughs> Not so nice. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, okay. I better shut up so you can ask me more questions. No. So, talk about the mantras. You said you have many mantras. What, uh, are, what is it? What's another mantra that you have that... Okay. Uh, I, I, I used it up. It's all connected. The, oh, gotcha. So, it's all, it's the, all of them combined. Yeah. The past is gone. The future may never be. Be in the moment, and Got it's it. so important because I can see all the stressors, all the kids, the getting there. What about you know getting there, the end? What about mean times? You might never get there. You might never retire. You might never go on a trip. Get a grip. So, Dr. Miller, 
you know, you said when you were young, you didn't have a voice. And what's interesting is I could see how some people, it may turn out they hide that voice forever and it feels like you've gone the opposite. And what, was there a, something that flipped in you or was, was it always like that? Always like that. Always uh, like that. Case in point, my sister, Judy, she died um, uh, seven years ago, just at the same time like my mm, husband. Sorry to hear that. Uh, you know, but if we live long enough, I was married for 53 years, a good, good unit, and I miss him more now than ever. Too bad. His time yeah. was up. I'm glad I'm still here. Okay. My sister, five years older, she was beaten down all her life passive what can i do and uh, no respect from her family never nothing in me just the opposite don't tell me i cannot do it so yeah as a psychology major in a phd whatever titles i have uh, yeah there's definitely some traits that we bring with that kind of resilience and that kind of counterphobia that i experienced just the opposite my mother had nightmares for the nazis every to the end of her life so yeah, it's like we are similar, but we are different. And you take this the guy from Uganda that coming, you know, that you just mentioned from Novers, from Schmutz, and look what he made a life of himself. And then you hear, and I obviously, uh, I, I ran, you know, the 10 mental health clinics for 40 years, but I saw patients, I put clients, and it's like, everything is a big deal. It's like my, you know, blaming my father, my mother, you know, blaming. Whatever. Hey, life isn't. I'd fair. love to sit in on one of your therapy sessions. <laughs> <laughs> Is it you just slapping people around? Like, oh, don't worry I, about it. You know what? I do that with my daughter. That's really amazing because again, here I'm the mother, but she has her father's gene. He was a depression boy and the, her cup is up empty. She's freaking. So when she says, oh my gosh, da -da, I, I saw I was so getting loans, who knows what, that I could not, I didn't wash my sheets and we don't have any sheets on the mattress. I said, are you kidding me? At least you have mattress. People are sleeping on the floor. I did. So I don't want to hear about it. I have my own issues. I talk to myself alone. I, I sing to myself. I smile because I live on myself. Everybody is somebody. Your father, they're dying on me. So I don't want to hear it. So cognitive therapy, my patience is not like, I, it's not, I don't have the answers. But you know, but you have a partner now. And I, I miss that part because I don't see, I don't see, I, it's, the time is mine and it's very seductive with my kids' friends. They don't know it. They, they say, can we please come by? They, they have, uh, you know, relationship issues. So I feel very about that part. But it's like, you know what, where, where do you want to be? What works, what doesn't work? Now you have a partner, me. How are we going to get there? Because I'm a problem solver. And I tell my daughter, it's not what you cannot do. What can you do? You know, so I don't mean to bark, but it's like I'm not normal. And most yeah. people have never experienced what they're going through right now. So Yeah, no, I love it because, you know, what you provide for people, your family is a perspective, you know, a, a viewpoint, a perspective that most people don't have at all, like almost no one. Right. So um, I remember one of my favorite books by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. And so, you know, you talked about your mom. She had nightmares all the way to the end was there any it seems like you're just like a resilient human being that was naturally like that is there anything that you think back on that you know haunts you or you're just like i'm just pushing forward no matter what um i'm so very lucky that i'm detached I was able, I, that is something that uh, I was concerned about in graduate school uh, when, we, when we saw, you know, in a group session when we saw patients and then we had a supervisor, Dr. Sharma, and in my colleagues, uh, they used to cry, come out. I mean, the pain that people go through. And I said, I always know it's their problem, not mine. I'm so wonderfully detached. So he said, I won't forget that, Dr. Sharma. Hey, some of us never get there. Luckily, you're you. So uh, I am who I am because of it, in spite of it. When, when, when the Russians liberated us, whatever, and we started walking, my father barely could stand up in the whole story. And my sister was wailing and crying. And my handsome, smart father that he kind of said go without me he was crying he couldn't walk and my mother who was a frail passive you know you know no 
no self is nothing person she was the strong one and i knew i had to be strong to mama so i was there the strong one i did not cry i gave her a hand to to prep up papa so that kind of me it's like that that opportunity i don't wish it on anybody but there are lots of traumas I was able to, uh, uh, I have to help, I have to, I have to, you know, be strong for mama or this. And by the way, I and knew. You're like 11 at the time. Huh? You're 11 years old at the time. Oh, when coming back, yeah. yeah. Almost 11, right, coming back. Wow. Uh, but also, you know, snippets, snippets, uh, the one, the two things that I need to tell you, because it's funny. I like to look good. Tell me, do I look good? Amazing. Okay, all right. Here I was looking in this little room, you know, in this little window that we shared with some Ukrainian family, a whole big story. Then they told the Russians that my father collaborated with the Nazis because he worked in their office. It doesn't matter. But it was a little tiny room, it was one bed. So my mother, my sister, me, I don't remember Papa. It was a little window. So every day morning I looked outside and those Jewish kind of with those uniforms, they're picking up dead bodies because people died from starvation and typhoid. When I looked out there, little kids, seven years old, eight years old, they looked so ugly. So I talked to myself, I still do. Uh, tomorrow, maybe I will be dead. Uh, I don't want to die ugly. Just before I die, I want to pulse. Guess what? I'm posing. I have, I'm going to have a celebration of the pre, pre my death on the, you know, in my, uh, you know, my beautiful casket. So the point being that is a memory and it's like that meaning to life is death. Tomorrow I could be dead. I never thought I would be 30. I never thought I would see my kids, whatever. I had a husband and two kids. I decided this is the time to go back to school. And eight years later, I had my PhD. Guess why? Because in a room, when we just got there, there were 20 people in one little room. Um, it's like monkeys. Have you been in Bali? You? No, I haven't. Okay. It, monkey colonies, they all huddle together and they louse themselves, all right? So I was with my mother, father, like little, you know, little family. This one woman, obviously she lost everybody. She was all alone, an old woman, maybe 40. She was wailing. Her contorted face was horrible for me. I was seven. So I wanted to go and touch her. And my mother, again, hold me tight. I, I did not know it then, but I knew someday I want to heal that contorted face. Uh, guess what, when Israel, uh, after, you know, after the army, after the air force, this and that, the only medical school was uh, Jerusalem. There's no way I could. So timing, heavy vision, I always knew when the opportunity would be right. I did not, I did not obsess about it. So when I felt safe, when my son went to first grade, he's younger than my daughter's three, then was the time for me to go back eight years. Nobody wanted me to do it. You could not stop it. I needed to heal by healing others, maybe I heal myself. And guess what? We worked mainly with probation departments, uh, domestic violence, anger management, sexual harassment. It's about respect. So yeah, we are who we are because of it, in spite of it. And they're similar and different. Some people sit in a corner like my sister and they're passive just till they die. And then there is me, look at me. Look how animated I am. Me. Audience of one, audience of 400. I just, I just connect. I'm just lucky to be alive. You know what? <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And you've had some really, you know, the grit and, and guts transitions. I mean, I can't even imagine at age seven, like I am right now, I have an eight year old, like ripping them from their house, going on somewhere where we're going to be basically in a, you know, a barbed area with a cage. It's a cage. Yeah. Right. For I can't days. imagine that at all. And then, you know, moving on, you went, I think you went to Israel at age 15. You went to Israel at that point. But before we go on to Israel, anything from that time period in the, when you were in the, the cage in that, you know, prison camp essentially that we didn't talk about that would be important to any story or anything important from that time period? Okay, I, I, again, I, I keep on saying, you know, the Jews, not just the Jews, I don't want to sound because the whole world is not Jewish. The resilience of people in a situation. 
I don't have memories of who or what was in my life there other than my mother, my sister, and my father. But I remember it's important to say, it's like right now, what can we do, what we cannot do? I remember, uh, I remember we were on stage singing and dancing. We had producers, we had teachers. I learned, I never went to school. Remember, I was seven. So I was never been, the first time I went to school when we came back in Romania, the fifth grade. So somebody had to teach me math and reading and writing. My mother tongue is German. So again, people do what they need to do in order to survive. So yeah, um, I don't, you know, and that, that's the case that we have to just be mindful that, that we can do it. And uh, some people are more resilient than other because like, you know, you know, you go, you are, are deported, you're, you hide in the yard, you, know, you go to China and you open a little store, you this and that. You don't just survive. You keep on plugging, you keep mm. on moving forward. That is the lesson that I kind mm. of, for me. Dr. Miller, during that time period, were you thinking at all that you would not survive that? Or were you not even thinking because you were that young that that was even coming into your head? No, it was not. I just, when I saw, when I looked at those dead, ugly people and I thought, hey, I could be me dead. Uh, you know, but I, I don't want to die ugly. It affected me. No, I never saw that I'm not going to live. When I came out as a young person, as a young mother, then I can, I, I thought, I mean, how come I'm still here? And I did not feel the, the remorse of, or survivor's remorse that you hear. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, no, it is like I just went along. I just, I just was in the moment. And, in, and I guess the appreciation for, for just figuring things out. I'm a problem solver. How do you do? Where are you? Where, how, can you how can you deal with whatever there is in order to move forward? So I am fearless. So when I go to those meetings, fearless women, you know, when I was in Ireland, who knows where I was. And it's like people are blown away because I am 85, 86 I was. If you could see me, I wear leather pants. I will don't tell me that I am an elder, that I cannot have long hair, that I have to come. I am defiant because society and traditions, you know, they're good. But it's everybody. I, I feel very much alone. And I think what gave it to me in the inner strength is you cannot count on anybody because here they die. I never thought mm -hmm. I wanted to be married. I never thought I wanted kids. Even now. Why is I, that? Because you know what, here you are and, and you're dead. You know, the losses, why bother? Mm, mm. So that what I, so I have issues with intimacy. I have two good kids and five grandkids. Everybody down and everything. I'm definitely a matriarch. We travel together and all that kind of thing. But again, yeah, to be alone, I'm used to it. So I don't feel kind of terrible. I have my rituals. I just, before you, I did the gym. I did all kinds of things, whatever. And so I'm self-contained because you never know. You cannot count on, the only one you can count on is yourself. And that came from my beginning. That kind of, I internalized it. Nobody told me that. So my strengths, probably the other side is vulnerability. And there's a trade-off. Then I am, you know, but I, I'm human. So nobody would believe me that I can, you know, the other day, I, I laid in the couch a whole day. I, I pretended that I'm sick. I just, I just needed to mourn. I just need to do nothing, okay? And then, okay, pick yourself up and go. So I don't even share it. When I have an accident in my car, whatever, I don't call my kids. I don't want to be like my mother if she had no life. I call the automobile club. I take care of myself. Mother, I'm so proud of you. Why didn't you call me? So my point being is we are who we are. We are affected differently. And it's like you make a lemonade out of lemon of life. Yeah. All of us. So Israel, Dr. Oh. Miller, so you had a dream to join the Israeli Air Force. Why? Why did you, why was that one of the things you wanted to do? Okay, don't give me, a, you know, wanted to, I want, uh, uh, that is the duty. Girls mm. in Israel, just like guys, mm. uh, when, uh, you know, 17 and a half, 18 years old, you're supposed, you have no choice, except when you're religious. You can say that you're orthodox, then you did not have to go as a girl. So they, uh, the few girlfriends that I remember, they all, they got married. 
And I thought it was horrible. The country needed me. So yeah, I, I didn't volunteer. You have to. But mm -hmm. yeah, I wanted to go to Air Force because of the blue of the blue suits, you know, not green. I like the blue better. And then and then the pilots. Oh my gosh, those Israeli pilots. I had such crushes. I wanted to go to the Air Force. And they said, How how do you think? Why would you go into there? It's so hard to get in Air Force. Everybody wants to go to the Air Force. Why is it? Wait and see. So I'm delusional. When I want something really, I make it happen. Or if I don't make it happen, maybe I don't remember. So because I had a, uh, I went uh, at night, uh, three years at night school. So from 15 till about seven and a half, I went to high school at night. Nobody, none of my friends did go. I just, you couldn't stop me. I was curious. And, and then, but I had two jobs during the day and all that kind of thing. So, uh, so because of my skills, I was educated. I spoke English. I was, you know, whatever. So I said, I want to go to the Air Force. And why would we run? Because I can take care of the, of the pilots, of the, of the airplanes, of the whatever. So yes, I got into the Air Force. And I can tell you those two years in the Air Force, uh, being in the dungeons, seeing where the, uh, you know, where the bullets are coming from and being night maneuver, but being part, part of a country, the, plus the, a majority. You cannot imagine what it meant for me to come from a Catholic country like Romania, looking behind you, or in the class when I came back in fifth grade, everybody made themselves crosses, the Catholic country. I was the only little Jewish kid. I didn't see anybody else. To come to Israel was hard. They didn't let us go out. But in 49, just a year after Israel became the state, to come and to feel, to feel the magnet of being the majority, of seeing police, of seeing... Uh, it's street cleaners, all Jewish. My father, when he saw a police guy, a Israeli police, he used to cross the other side. He was scared of authority. But my, again, to me, so I embraced it all. I went to a kibbutz. I learned their language, ta, 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 ta. So being in the Air Force was absolutely, I mean, then my first love, I did not think I don't want to get married. I don't need nobody, whatever. In my first love, you know, Aaron, oh my gosh. And it's so funny. Okay, I don't know by the time you better watch my time. You're um, totally good. It's what two years or three years ago. Um, my daughter says, Mother, it would be really nice if we would go next. I go every two years to Israel. It's part of APEC, I'm a senator club, whatever. We go to Israel. It would be really nice to go to the base camp where you were for two years in Israel. It's next to the Lebanon border. I said, that would really be cool. So she arranged it. You cannot go in there. It's kind of a hidden one of those reconnaissance, close by whatever. By the way, Azer Weizmann, uh, if you know, he was the president of Israel one of the time. He was my commander in chief. Boy, mm. did I have a crush on him too. It was really interesting because when he died a few years ago, he was only about three or four years older than me. But when you're 17 and a half, somebody 23 or 24. So yeah, so we went in. So we had, I had to prove I was in the Air Force and they made such a big fuss over me. 70 years later, they had somebody to come back and, and I took pictures and they said, don't, 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 because you cannot put it on Facebook. But my daughter snipped me with, with a gorgeous pilot. He looked the same, like all oh, my pilots from my past. I have him here on my, on my bookshelf. And I, I waited. So yeah, so, is there, so uh, the Air Force was absolutely, again, um, empowering. I'm unique. I'm special. Uh, I'm, my country needs me, not like my, 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 my the girlfriends, no guts. They were very jealous of me because when I, they hear they were stuck with the kid that they had with them and I was traveling, I was doing and all that kind of thing. In those days, for a young girl like me, I was an old maid of 24 to travel all over Europe to come and visit my sister and the rest is history. So yeah, there's another chapter. And by the way, the movie, the script that I hope that we're at carpet, maybe you'll be invited now that we I'd met. love to be invited. Okay. There we are speaking about that is that the vision, that the story, the vision, the, the excitement of being the majority in Israel. And it also, yeah, uh, the different chapters. So that was Israel. And then I happened to stumble 
you know, just come and visit. My sister came to Los Angeles many times because I dated a Moishe guy. My heart was not into, but everybody was pressuring me. I was an old maid of 24, 25. Okay, I'll go and marry Moishe, whatever. First let me, huh? And then destiny happened, just like you and me met. Huh? Uh, my husband-to-be, a Jewish boy from Independence, Missouri, you know what? Again, a blind date. And no, it was not a love affair, but it was the best unit ever because, again, I was ready. And here, yeah, it's a big story. And so then a new chapter. Who so, set you up on that? Huh? You said you, your husband you met on a blind date? Yeah, somebody. Who set you up? It was really, oh, destiny. I was visiting, and a, and a woman, Bina, a cousin of a cousin, was visiting here. And so she went to the, it was high holiday. So she went to shul. Here she sat next to a, a woman with a young man. And on the, you know, so uh, she said, is he single? I was just visiting here and I was an old man. <laughs> so she said, she said to the mother, is he single? And she said, yes, he is. So the rest is history. I'm telling you, it's just absolutely destiny. And I don't know what it means, destiny. I don't know what it means. Is there free will or are we robots that is, we are predestined to just do, move, whatever. So I, I know it's both because yeah, there's free will, but it's also destiny. The unexpected lurks in the bushes. So life is an amazing journey. Uh, I miss my, I'm not dead yet. I miss myself already, but goes on in space. Are you kidding me? But goes in, in personal medicine and, and the genome splitting. It's absolutely, look at me, I'm so hyper. It doesn't hurt any. So your favorite story from the Israeli Air Force, what sticks out to you as, as a memory? Uh, with Aaron, my first and only love, I mean, I mean, my first boyfriend, huh? and then again in the movie, whatever, unfortunately, that's why you cannot come close to somebody. We were together eight months like this, and it's a love story, and then he, his plane was shut down. Mm. So again, so my favorite memory was being behind because I lived in Tel Aviv and the, in the airport where I was, was close to Haifa. So people that were around Haifa could go home, but it was too far for me. So I stayed on the base and, the, and he had a motorcycle, Vespa. So my memory of being behind him, hugging him really close, going through lakeside barriers to Kinneret, to Tzfat, being behind him, the memory of, 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 of the motorcycle and the freedom and, and the beauty and the excitement of being alive in, in a, as a majority, being in the, in the land that, that was only a dream before. Those are the memories. There are lots of memories, but that sticks out. Going to school at night, my mother worried I'll never find a husband, I'll be too smart. And my, my, whatever it is, Israeli government tourist information office, I worked for two years because I was educated, meeting all those tourists. How I got the visa even to go and visit because they wouldn't let girls out because they wouldn't come back. So I have a lot of moments, but Israel, and by the way, I was very guilty that I left and never came back. There was never the, there was never the deal. That you I, left Israel, you mean? Yeah, I just came just to visit. I, I believed that all Jews should be in Israel. I don't believe it anymore. We need to be scattered all over the world. That's the way we are. Mm. But I felt very, very strong. So I was married. I had two kids. I still had, did not have the citizenship here. I felt so guilty that I went to University of Judaism. I became a Hebrew teacher just to keep in touch, at least to do something to connect. I had nightmares because I used to judge young people that used to go for it. It's a hard life. It was a hard life in Israel. It was not like in, you know, in America. But but you know what, uh, I guess I saw like um, the lion want to get for blood, they want to get, I saw the opportunity. I saw here that I could become a doctor. I saw the opportunity, I never had it. So part of me, I, the guilt, I worked on it, but I did what I, I, I felt strong. If I would not have done that, if I would just been a nice little housewife, being two steps behind my husband that he expected, just like his mother, I would probably have been depressed and being in bed and not getting out because there is a, a low part in me. So I just follow my heart. What, um, at the time, what would you say the percentage of women in the Israeli Air Force? Okay, and, and um, a memory is spotty, maybe conveniently. I don't remember the only friends I had in for two years, the old guys. I really, there must have been more. Mm. I'm the only one there again. Yeah. 
I took care of the, the pilots. They used to call they needed to be their planes to be ready and all that. So I was one of the guys. I always related to the guys all my life more than to the girls because, again, I'm a high achiever. Uh, you know what I'm into, you know what I'm into, climbing trees and swimming, all that kind of thing that the girls did, education. So uh, I don't remember, uh, mm. I cannot imagine there was no other girl, but not in the Air Force, yeah. I remember. Was it, do you feel like you were treated differently or the experience was a lot different because you were a woman during that time? Uh, mm. No, no. I got a lot of attention because I was a fire spit, spitfire, like you see me now. I was excited, I was engaging, I was curious, and I, saw, and I felt very powerful because I was very important. They all needed to come to, to the office. I was in charge of the office. They came, they needed me. And I just, you know, before I, I, I got close to Aaron, uh, whenever I heard his voice, I started to, uh, again, my imagination went bananas because you know, I'm a Scorpio, I'm a very sexy in my imagination. So my, no, I never felt, I never felt because I'm a woman, just the opposite, I got mm. a lot of attention. Mm. What brought you, then you went to LA? Just to come and visit my sister. They had a hard time. She married an Israeli. They had a hard time, the two kids. And he had an aunt here uh, that was a widow. And she asked, come be here. I'll buy you a house. I need somebody to be. She didn't have any kids. So my sister and her husband, Israel, he was a Sabra. Uh, they came and they relocated to Los Angeles. So before I'm getting married to Moishe or whatever his name was, I thought I would visit. I would go and, and visit Europe. Huh? visit other you know israeli you know offices and then and then you know then come back and get married so uh it was just supposed to be a visit and then like i said destiny happened because i almost like uh uh this is my opportunity and it was not easy for me to decide to stay so uh so yeah so it just happened in a, a bingo that uh, she was here from Israel, Bina, whatever her name was, and whatever, and the rest is history. So we had a wonderful union. Uh, Jerry, he was smart. He was, you know, funny. We, 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 we built a nest, uh, two really good kids. Uh, he was a loose cannon in real estate. He was a teacher, but he was bored. So in the summer, it's like when we just married, they had we bought it for the down payment first house. He borrowed, and he bought a duplex, and they kept on. So when there was a crash, in, in Austin, Texas, and we were, you know, we had property here. He sold in Los Angeles and we bought in Austin, Texas. Mm. And he did really good by us. So it's just opportunity. If not for me, he would not have done because he was scared that he's going to fail. His mother, depression person, very insecure. And to me, being in Israel, there's no failure. Something doesn't work out, you try something else. So we made a real good team and you know what? And life has been an amazing journey and it's going to continue healthily to 123. Amen. <laughs> the 10 mental health clinics, you know, some people would have gone on, you know, maybe had a small practice, you know, maybe done some teaching and you kind of just seems you go big or go home. So what is um, maybe some of the lessons or, uh, from that time period of, you know, managing, running 10 mental health clinics, overseeing over 40 clinicians. What did that, that part teach you? Uh, take advantage of opportunity. Uh, I did not plan for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, opportunity was the Jerry, my husband, um, he was a marketing guy. You know, he was a teacher, but real estate, this and that. So I graduated and I had my PhD and uh, I interned, you have to have about 3,000, 6,000 hours. It was 50, 60 years ago. So I went for the foundation and because it's marriage and family and all that. And because I had the PhD and get my hours, uh, she, the owner, the, the director made me kind of in charge. So I, uh, I took the, in, the phone calls and then I took people that I wanted to see and I tell her, but then she could not handle that people came to me, not to her. So it was very hard for her to have me there. So I needed to leave and I didn't have a license yet. So really interesting. So somebody told me, so I had to leave. That when you go on, you know, go in the in Encino in, in the mountain in Los Angeles, there's a reverend there at church. 
and for a hundred dollars you get the you get the title reverend so with the reverend then you can have a counseling so that's what i did and then i, I had an office and my husband because he was a marketing guy he says okay i can get you i can get you patients uh, so he went to the union and you know in union and he says hey I will take insurance for food. Send me your send me your your people, uh, and then a number of, of therapists from that for the foundation they followed me. So we opened a clinic, and one, one clinic in in the Los Angeles area, and then they came like hordes. So I needed more, and somebody said, if you were to open an office in Best LA, in Orange County, whatever, we could we would love to have you because you accept insurance for food. So my point being is. It's a, it's a team effort. It just happened. Uh, you have to be, you know, not everybody, you have to have guts because curse, you have an overhead. Are you kidding me? You have to pay, you know, and, and you have to pay and all that kind of thing. So I, I am open. And then I say, I'm in the process of evolving forever. I mean it. I act on the opportunity. So that's what, that's what happened. I didn't plan for it, but with Jerry's skills of just getting, and then, and then, uh, I was a therapist, but then it was a need. As I opened all those offices, there was a need for uh, an administrator, somebody that runs the show. I did not. Guess what? As an executive director of Miller Psychological Centers, I picked, handpicked all the therapists, psychiatrists, social workers. Uh, I supervised them. I, uh, and, you know, so we, with the courts, but my point is, it's being open and opportunity and skills and having courage. It takes courage and life is an amazing journey and uh, it's a team effort. It takes a village. I really well, remember. The toughest part about running that many clinics and that large organization. You know, but I'm very, I'm, I'm a detailist, I'm a minimalist and I'm in charge of really good tools. And I just, it was, it was like a piece of cake. Like now when I run, and I don't brag, I share, I have 11 buildings, 300 tenants in Austin tenants. And, you know, everybody in the team, everybody is important. I treat everybody like we cannot be each other. So you have to have the organizational skill. I took organizational psychology, you know, as far as in a part of the classes. And I went and again, uh, you know, uh, no wasteful how you know in hospitals kind of efficiency and all that kind of thing so i i have the innate tools of being very organized detailed and being able to sit around and be multitasking so to me it was a piece of cake i just fell into it i missed seeing patients i still do mm -hmm. because for me to have someone that comes in why are you here why now? Where do you want to be in five years? Before we start, I need four sessions to the testing to see what makes you tick. And then let's see what your background is. And big deal, not to dwell on it. You're smiling. Hey, you want I to? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that because I had, you know, long term patients, very interesting because I had really. Uh, uh, you know, uh, coming from CSPP, California School of Professional Psychology, uh, it was a clinical, like Freudian kind of thing. Cognitions, I just adapted later. So I know how to work long term. And I had, because it's Hollywood, I had uh, name recognition people that had money because I saw them three times a week. And my, my longest patient, it was five years, three times a week. And he was my, he was my, uh, again, I, I in my part, very detached. I would like to take him home and heal him. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I miss that because I'm very clear and not everybody, you cannot reach everybody, but I feel that, I mean, people even now, the same phone number I have is the same one that I had 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I still have phone calls and hangups. They want to hear my exit and voice. Because again, I'm very firm, very clear. Yes, life is not fair. It sucks. Losses suck. Okay, fine. You can sit there and, and twiddle your tongue. Okay, hey, what can we do? You're not alone. You have me. And yeah, you know, you have to agree that you're not going to kill yourself. If not, I'm going to take you in my practice. And guess what? In 40 years, no, it's not funny. People, I mean, people kill themselves. No, it's, it's that's not funny. It's just a matter of fact. Like, you can't join my practice. It's almost like you're making them sign an agreement. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Right, and I had close calls, but they called me in the middle of the night because I think when somebody, you know, says that, you know, if, if the abyss is very deep, people kill themselves. And I get it, you know, but, uh, you know, I get it very much. So, yeah, I'm not a saint and I'm not whatever, psychic, whatever, but I have really good, good tools, mm -hmm. life experience, and, and, and some things you cannot learn. You got it, you know. So, um, I miss one-to-one. -one. Last, you know, I have two last questions. And first, thank you. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for sharing your gusto. You know, and everyone should check out DrEricaMiller.com, who actually also happens to be the name of my sister-in-law. Um, uh, but D-R-Erica, E-R-I-C-A-M-I-L-L-E-R.com. Check it out. There's some amazing content, videos. Check out her books. And if you're in need of a speaker, um, you know, if you couldn't tell from, from her talking already, she can move people to action. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the audience, and the nice thing is that I'm a vagabond forever. I, I like to travel. So I've been someone that come to Chicago. You can be the keynote speaker and, you know, who knows what. I'm there in a heartbeat all over the world. So, hey, your audience, if you need somebody to inspire somebody, uh, no matter what group it is, I then, I, accordingly, I can, I can interact and relate because, ah, right. Check it out, DrEricaMiller.com, D-R, Erica Miller. Now, so last two questions, Dr. Miller, is one I always ask since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment that you had to push through and what's been a proud moment for you when you think um, of a big milestone that you were especially proud of? What's been, um, I mean, we talked about a lot about different challenging and low moments. Uh, maybe you don't consider them low moments, but what's okay. been something you had to push through? Okay. Let me start with the proudest moment. Yeah. Okay. The proudest moment is when I graduated with a cap, you know, with graduation. When I had my mother, my father, my husband, my two kids, whatever, they applauded me. That moment, in spite of it, because of it, it was unheard of. Again, great odds. Eight years nonstop. I still was cooking and we still traveled. But again, can you imagine a graduate student, whatever? So that was the proudest. Now, uh, you know, uh, an ex friend, I don't have many friends my age because they're all nice people, but they're boring, right? But one friend that she went back to school, her husband was an attorney and she wanted to be an attorney, said, You can never make it. So she proved to him that she can make it. But again, uh, she dumped me because I did not reach out for her. I, I was, I'm very passive, okay? So um, the question, the question that you put to me, she used to say, you're so in denial. You, you're saying what other people dare not to even think. So I cannot think, and it, it, it sounds incredible. I don't remember a low moment that I, you know, the, the abyss. Yeah, when, when Jerry died, and I, I was expecting it was not a something. He was kind of dying. And so I needed about a week, I was on the couch. And my kids were very worried about me because all his friends are his friends. They were worried about me. They wanted to go away. I just knew it's a new life for me. So yeah, if you can, that was a low point. But I was planning, what do I do next? I wanted to rot. Maybe that is too strong of a word. Um, the other day, because again, I feel kind of restless because whatever. I decided because I kept up with all my bills, my, my, uh, my plug for the in you know for the website all my things were written and i didn't feel like reading anymore so i laid in on the couch the whole day and i make it i believe that i'm sick how else can i excuse laying on the couch there's so much things to do cleaning closets or whatever so no the good moments the other ones it's like when i say life doesn't owe you anything uh you know what uh it's an amazing journey embrace it all it sounds so kind of uh, lala but no, I really feel that it's a self-imposed. It's like uh, you embrace it all. The thick and thin of life, I'm just glad to be alive. So yeah, cannot give you any down other than I'm human. I get frustrated, but no, I just, I, I, I just, if I have the mantra, I'm lucky to be alive. 
Life is an amazing journey. I hope I continue healthily, but I do something about it. So when all those young people are want a piece of me, how seductive is it? They want to grow old like me. So all my friends are young people, young like you. All the people, they're either in the, they're dead or they are in homies, or they are in, you know, in the retirement. Nothing wrong with this. So when Jerry died, it's so funny. My daughter and my son, Johnny, he's a big shot, a lawyer at Sony's, right? They came and they ganged up on me. Mother, you, you don't have any friends. You're all alone. I really think, we think that you, you should go, you know, and be in that very high-end retirement place, that lectures. So I said, are you finished? <laughs> it will never happen. I will never leave my home. And I wish next time you are in Los Angeles. My home is like Dracula's castle. I'm a European girl. All the ceilings, everything is textured. And my home is just an amazing. It is like, you know, it's like a museum. My kids wouldn't live in it. They're very conservative. So my point being is I'm just, you know, I'm all over the place and I, I, at the end of life, my, my, everything is in order, my will, even my speech that uh, kids, I want you to read them. I have the casket, whatever. So I can continue more of the same. I'm here and I'm talking to you. And there's no dementia in my family. So not, not likely that I'll be Alzheimer's. If I am, I'm going to ask somebody to kill me. And it's possibly in California. <laughs> Let's end on this because I know you have to go. What's the title of your movie? Uh, okay, we don't have it's from tra from trauma to trauma. We don't have it yet mm -hmm. because first, and that is really a challenge. And if you like me, I know you like me. We bonded in a heartbeat, right? Mm -hmm. It's who you know because they're speaking about producer or or or, or somebody in access would like to play me. They have an agent. Uh, because the script is kind of juicy. I helped it along. It's all based on my story, a little bit embellished, because about the economics, who's going to buy it? And whoever's going to buy it is going to do anything they want, because you can, I just want red carpet, because I'm, there's meaning. But the, the dime it doesn't. You have to know who do you know in order to have a filmmaker and not somebody that is fighting to, you know, to, to whatever, wait. I don't have time to wait. I want a movie, but I'm still here. So the title will come, something has to be something, something attractive. Uh, uh, trauma to triumph, very eh, boring. Maybe just Erica, which is a wildflower. Maybe something, and you know, I know a lot, but I know it's a team kind of like brainstorming, which are like, by the way, play to society, you know, growing, you know, with other people, you know, co you know communication, all the for learning forever. The team makes it happen, whether it's comedy, whether it's, you know, movie, whatever. So uh, I don't know the name yet. Mm -hmm. But again, just because I envision doesn't mean it's going to happen. Who do I think I am? But I just, but I just put the word out into your uni universe. And you're part of my universe now. Have your eyes open. If somebody, I can email them. It's all finished. But somebody has to see it. If not, it will never happen. And I, I don't accept it. I, would, I got into the Air Force. Remember? I'm going to look through my notes, Dr. Miller. I think the title is somewhere in here. I don't know. But um, I'm going to take a picture of this and send it to you. And um, I know you have to go, but it's always an absolute pleasure talking to you. Everyone should check out DrEricaMiller.com for more. And uh, just thank you. Uh, yeah. And I hope we meet again because destiny throws us together, right? Make That's it right. happen. Okay? We'll do, for sure. It was fun for me too. Bye bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.